Hi everyone, in this video we're going to take a look at an introduction to what organic chemistry is about and at the end of this video you should be able to know the naming and some of the trends in the different homologous series of organic compounds. So before we begin, I would like you all to download the PowerPoint file in the link below so that you can uh, participate in the activity that we are going to carry out. This is a brief overview of the content covered in the O and N level organic chemistry syllabus. You notice that they are broken down into various subtopics and depending on which is the exam that you are sitting for, the breadth of content that you are covering would be different. But for each of these subtopics, we are going to address the same questions. Where do these organic molecules come from? What are they used for? How do we name them? What are their physical properties, chemical properties? and characteristics. When we think of the term organic, you know, most of us may think of organic products, organic produce, but when it comes to chemistry, the term organic actually means something else. Basically, it is the study of carbon-based molecules. Over here, you will see on the left examples of organic molecules, and we find that for organic molecules, they are all based on carbon. Carbon is the main uh, atom that is present. It doesn't mean that having carbon automatically makes it an organic molecule, but all organic molecules definitely contain carbon, and many of them contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, these three elements. Okay? So in organic chemistry, we are studying uh, carbon and its compounds. They are all covalent in nature, and many of them involve carbon and hydrogen bonds. Organic chemistry was a branch of science that came about uh, fairly late, and prior to that, people thought that these molecules could only be made by living things. So this concept is known as vitalism. And this guy called Friedrich Wuller, uh, he was the one who pioneered organic chemistry through an accidental discovery. He initially tried to synthesize ammonium cyanide with the formula NH4CNO. However, by accident, he, he made urea, which has a different structural formula altogether. And urea, as you know, is found in urine. And by him synthesizing urea, it kind of debunked the myth that these organic molecules could be made by animals or living things only. And this gave rise to the birth of organic chemistry and scientists started to try to make organic molecules in the lab. So let's do a very quick recap on chemical bonding. So many of our organic compounds will contain the following elements. Okay, I would like you all to consider the electronic configuration and tell me how many covalent bonds do each of these elements form. Pause the video and think about this. So here are the electronic configurations. We can see that the number of uh, bonds that they form is the number of electrons they need to have a fully filled valence shell. So carbon will form four bonds, hydrogen one, oxygen two, and nitrogen three. And this number of bonds is important when we draw the structure of molecules later on. Why do we need a branch of chemistry just to study the carbon compounds? It's because there are so many compounds around us that are made uh, using carbon. It is because of the unique properties of carbon that enable carbons to form uh, bonds to so many different kinds of elements and in so many different ways. Uh, this one is just for your information, but just to share with you that carbon can form multiple bonds. So there is single bond, double bond, triple bonds. Carbon can also form structures in the form of rings it can form very long chains. And the strength of covalent bonds uh, between carbon atoms is relatively strong. Okay, and this is why nature chose carbon as one of the essential elements for life. So besides its presence in living things, organic chemistry is all around us in all the pharmaceutical products, uh, in material science, okay, and in, also in food science. Okay, these are just some examples of organic molecules that you'll find uh, around you. Within us, we also find many organic compounds, and just to point out one of them, hemoglobin, uh, contains this heme group containing iron, which binds to oxygen and helps our blood to transport oxygen. Organic molecules are also found in the food that we eat, coming from carbohydrates, proteins, and also fats. Things that we use, for example, uh, materials, our mobile phones, tires, and even the helmet uh, that is used by soldiers make use of organic compounds and Kevlar is one of the materials that is very strong and can withstand the heat of a bullet. That's why it's used to build 
helmets. So in this picture below, see if you can uh, find me over there. If you have ever seen our Singapore $10,000 note, you will notice at the back that it's printed with some organic molecules. And this signifies R&D being one of the key pillars of our economy. The banknotes themselves uh, are made of plastic, which is polypropene, uh, and it's also an organic molecule. There are many ways uh, through which we can draw organic molecules and represent them. The most basic one that we have encountered before is the dot and cross diagram. Okay, so you may want to spend a couple of minutes to draw the dot and cross diagram for methane. I'd like to share different modes by which we represent molecules. The ball and stick model enables us to have a 3D representation of things. The structural formula uh, is what we commonly write. It is straightforward and simple to show how the atoms are being connected. The molecular formula will be familiar with and the dot and cross structure is also shown here. With that, uh, we will start with our first activity. So if you could follow along, download the PowerPoint file, you will open it and see various cards over here. So you may want to spend some time to look at them, the names, the properties, and also how the atoms are connected. Spend about five minutes. How would you categorize and organize these molecules into your own categories? One of the more common ways students sort the cards based on my experience would be as such. So students will observe that you know, there are some patterns in the name, like that. And they will group those with the similar kind of naming in the same category. Do you, do you manage to come up with something like this? Okay, if not, we'll go through some other ways of categorizing later. So this is just one way by, by the naming. And the naming of the molecule is actually related to its structure. Okay, so if you look at the first uh, column, all those that end with the A and E, right? They only have C and H, all single bonds. Correct? And remember I mentioned, right? Um, we link back to chemical bonding. Carbon always forms four bonds. Yeah, so in every molecule you observe, uh, this will always be true. Then, uh, in the second column, you will observe that they all end with E and E and they all have this part in the molecule. In the next group, you will observe they all have this OH. Okay, and they all end with OL. And then in the final group, right? You observe they all have this part in the molecule and they end with oic acid. So these are the similarities uh, within each column. Okay, so the parts that are highlighted here and here and here, these are called functional groups. What exactly is a functional group? A functional group is a group of atoms that determines the unique characteristics of a compound. They determine what kind of chemical reactions uh, your molecules will undergo. So we can say that molecules with the same functional group, that same group of atoms, undergo similar kind of chemical reactions. The second way uh, by which students will classify uh, the, the cards will be as such, based on the first part of the name instead. So those that start with the math, Okay, those that start with F, those that start with, those that start with prop, those that start with but, here. Okay, and what do you notice? It is related to the number of carbon atoms in the molecule. Those with one carbon, methane, methanol, methanoic acid. Two carbons, ethane, ethene, ethanol, ethanoic acid. So the front part of the name tells us the number of carbon atoms. So this is another way you could classify the molecules. Right now, you would have noticed that in the names of organic compounds, there are two parts, the prefix, the front part, and the suffix, the back part. And we join this together, we get the name, which tells us how many carbons there are, and what is the functional group that is present. Okay, so let's do a quick practice over here. I have three compounds, one, two, and three, are you able to give me their names? You can pause the video and think about it. So the first one is called butanol because it has four carbons. 
and this functional group. Second example, there are three carbons, so it's pro, and this functional group tells me it ends with in. Third example, there are two carbons, so it must start with a, and it has this functional group COOH, which means it is oic acid, so we call it ethanoic acid. Going back to our cut sort, some of you may classify it based on this. You would realize from the melting and boiling point that a group of them tend to be gases at room temperature and the other group tend to be liquid at room temperature. So the question here, why aren't any of them solids at room temperature? You will find that many of them have a pretty low melting and boiling point. This is because all of them have a simple molecular structure. And this would mean they have a very weak intermolecular forces of attraction between the molecules and therefore little energy is required to overcome. Okay, and this will be true for all of them because they have a simple molecular structure. If you look at a number of carbons, let's just look at the first column. As the molecules get bigger, what do you notice about the boiling point. As the molecules get larger, the boiling point increases and boiling point again related to intermolecular forces of attraction. So as molecules get larger, there is increase in the strength of intermolecular forces of attraction and therefore more energy required to overcome them. Why is it when molecules get larger, the intermolecular forces of attraction get stronger? It's because when they get bigger, there is much more surface area, more electrons. So the attractive forces between the molecules will become stronger as well. More extensive intermolecular forces of attraction. Okay, so this is how we can explain the trend in the boiling point going down uh, the series here. Another way you could have classified uh, the compounds will be based on whether they have a certain kind of atoms. So on the left hand side, they only have carbon and hydrogen. We call them hydrocarbons, only contain C and H. Whereas the non-hydrocarbon will contain CH and maybe other kinds of elements. Okay, I want to bring your attention to a new vocabulary called saturated versus unsaturated. So in organic chemistry, when we say a saturated molecule, we are saying that all the bonds between carbon, they are all single bonds. Whereas when we say unsaturated, there is a presence of a carbon-carbon double bond. And that brings us back to our original arrangement of this thing called a homologous series. In science, the term homo, the prefix homo means same. Right? So homologous series means that this family, there are some similarities between them. Okay, so we have your alkanes, we have your alkenes, we have alcohols, and we have carboxylic acid. Within each family, there is some similarities. What kind of similarities? They have the same functional group. They have a trend in the properties like melting and boiling point, and they will have the same general formula. What do I mean by the term general formula? Okay, for example, uh, your alkanes, right? This is the general formula, Cn, H2n plus 2. So when n equals to 1, we get the formula C1, H4. So it will be CH4. The second member is n equals to 2. So C2, H, 2n plus 2, that will be 6. And the third member, like that, we get a C3, H8 and the fourth member we get a C4H10. So this is called the general formula which allows us to predict what is the formula of the n member. Okay, so we go all the way down when n equals to 10, uh, then it will be a C10H22 uh, because it's 2n plus 2. So the general formula allows us to predict the n member. Uh, molecular formula. So you may want to challenge yourself with the math 
and think about what the general formula could be for alkenes, alcohols, and carboxylic acids. You may want to pause and think about it. Okay, so here are the answers. So the general formula is shown above. Okay, so just take note uh, for the exceptions uh, because there is no methane because in order for it to have a CC double bond, minimally you need two carbons. Lah. So N, the first member is N equals to 2 for your alkenes here. Okay, and for carboxylic acid, the first member is N equals 0 because the functional group itself contains one carbon. Okay, so just take note of that uh, difference. So here's a summary. Uh. We have different homologous series. This refers to a family of organic compounds. They have the same functional group. Remember, functional group is a group of atoms in a molecule that determines the chemical properties of that molecule. And therefore, they have the same chemical properties. So everyone in the same family reacts the same way. They have the same general formula for alkenes, alkenes, alcohols, carboxylic acid. And for every next member that you have, you are adding a CH2 group of atoms. Okay, so you're not sure what this means, you can go back here. Okay, what does it mean by add a CH2? You see here to here, I add this part. Here to here, I add one more of the CH2. Here to here, I add one more of this. And it's going to be the same for the rest. You're adding a CH2 to the molecule as you go down. So every member becomes longer and longer because you add one more carbon uh, to the molecule. Okay, so there is actually no end to this. And then they show a trend in the properties. So as the molecules become larger, boiling point increases. And as the intermolecular forces of attraction become stronger, they pack more closely together and therefore increase in density. It's also related to intermolecular forces of attraction. Viscosity will refer to how thick the fluid is, how easily it will flow. So if you think about it, honey is a very viscous liquid, whereas water is less viscous. Okay, so what affects viscosity, what makes some uh, liquids uh, flow very slowly? It is also the strength of attraction between the molecules. If the molecules attract each other strongly, they will not flow very easily. So again, going back to intermolecular forces. So actually this tree, right, the trend is the same. Okay, and the last point on flammability, the more carbons you have, it is more difficult to burn it because to burn carbon compounds, you need oxygen. The more carbon you have, the more oxygen you will need to, to burn it fully and therefore the flammability will decrease. Okay, so take note of flammability being an opposite trend. Here, I would like to end off with a summary of what we have covered in today's lesson. We have learned how to do naming, that's the prefix suffix. We have learned about what a functional group is. We have learned about the term hydrocarbon. What does it mean when we say something is a hydrocarbon? We have learned how to use the word saturated versus unsaturated. Unsaturated meaning there is a presence of at least one carbon-carbon double bond. We have learned about what the homologous series mean. Okay, in the future lessons, we will go into individual homologous series. For isomers, um, for combined size, you are not required to know this term. For pure chem, we will look at uh, it in more detail uh, when we cover alkanes and alkenes. We have learned about the naming of organic compounds and these are the prefixes and suffixes. We have also learned how to draw, knowing that each carbon must always have four bonds, meaning four lines coming out of it. Each oxygen always have two bonds and each hydrogen always have one bond. And this is how you know whether what you draw is correct. So you can use this table as a guide as to how you are going to draw and write the structural formula. So that's all we have for today's video. Hopefully you have a better understanding of what organic compounds are and how to name them. See you next time.